day of school. Study hard. You need your pencils out, and you're going to work as a team. All right, the letter T. Teenage Ninja Turtle. Turtle, turtle, turtle. Welcome aboard Lozano One. And guess where we're going? To space. Three, two, one. <laughs> Times are changing. There's more stuff out there to learn than we can teach you. You gotta learn how to learn. If you want to look up a state bird, how are you gonna find that in the book without reading the whole thing? Look in the end. That's it. Do you know where jazz music was born? Louisiana. Oh my gosh. Good writers don't tell. What do they do? Show. They show things. Do anything you want with it. Just write. I saw myself sipping champagne out of a crystal glass with a ravishingly beautiful woman when all of a sudden something pulled me into the car. I was scared because they were headed to a tree. Are you going to do your best? Yes. Do you feel good about yourself? Yes. Six into 17. Kevin. I love it. You're right. These children are totally engaged by their teachers and their schools. Tonight, instead of simply talking about good education, what shape is Earth? We are going to show it. Yeah! A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Learning in America is solely funded by the Chrysler Corporation in the belief that only a quality education will keep America competitive today and tomorrow. The divisions of Chrysler are Chrysler, Plymouth, Dodge, Dodge Trucks, Jeep, and Eagle. Say hello to the high school class of 2000. Today they are third graders, but in little more than 10 years they should be 12th graders graduating from high school, preparing to start college or to start work. I say should be 12th graders because unless American public education improves dramatically, one out of three will drop out before graduation. And even among those who do graduate, five out of six will be unable to do anything beyond the simplest arithmetic, unable to write a persuasive letter, unable to follow anything beyond the simplest instructions. None of this is new and hardly anyone has anything good to say about the American public school system. Last year, we broadcast Learning in America, which turned out to be a rather gloomy overview of the problems of education from kindergarten to college. But tonight, we will look at our elementary schools, and we will report on the educational process at its best exemplary schools where students and teachers perform with skill and enthusiasm yeah. where morale attendance and test scores are all high tonight we shall visit four such schools and not one of them is affluent with fast-track children from college educated parents they are average schools but they have extraordinary teachers principals parents and children our objective tonight is to try to identify those qualities which have enabled these four schools and others like them to succeed, often in the face of daunting obstacles. Our hope is these four schools will provide lessons which other schools and educators can apply across the nation. We begin in Manhattan, Kansas. One, two, three. School, school, golden rule. Find your name. This is a mostly white, mostly working class school in the heartland of America, a so-called mainstream school. Statistics tell us that most mainstream Americans are poorly educated, but those statistics do not apply to the Northview Elementary School here in Manhattan, Kansas. What I basically have here is a pizza. So I want to have three-fourths of my pizza have green peppers. Believe it or not, this is a lesson on fractions in Renee Miley's fourth grade class. I want you to go into your groups and... These 24 fourth graders spend most of their time in groups, 
cooperative learning, it's called, and you can't get thrown out of this class for sharing information. Okay, let's get some ideas down. Get your finger on Do sauce first. The whole thing sauce. The whole thing sauce? Yeah. No, but you don't do it. Jackie? Jackie. Color? So what do we want for the green peppers? How much do we want? Half. 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 Let's put three-fourths pepper and one-fourth onions. Pepperoni is awesome. <laughs> Draw an imaginary line. The reality is that kids can learn from each other as well as from the teacher. And along the way, they absorb a lesson for life, the lesson of cooperation. I'm five-eighths, and um, Colby will be three. Yeah. Josh, huh? five-eighths mozzarella, three-eighths Colby. Let's put three-fourths pepperoni. No, not pepperoni. Hey, right here, right here. Class, can I point out something on the board? This group decided they really like mozzarella cheese and they didn't go with the same fractions that we talked about. Look what they did. Okay, they went with their three-eighths and five-eighths. Very creative. That's what I want you guys to do is to realize... Renee Miley, born and educated in Indiana, has been teaching at Northview for four years. I think when a lot of people used to go to school that are my age and my parents' age, you sat in your desk and you were taught one learning style. And if you didn't catch it, in the learning style that, was, that that teacher taught to you, you didn't get it. And then you were labeled dumb or you were labeled um, rebellious or defiant. These guys are ready to start their pizza. Yeah. 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 Look, I'm going to make a line. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crow. You have, we have clean hands, don't worry. <laughs> Use your spatula. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Right there. Let's do it again. I'll do, cut it and you watch, okay? Because you're watching, okay? That's half, right? Force and eight. So, so we one, two, three. Half of a, this. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh, now I see. Okay, do you guys see? Yeah, yeah I do. Okay. You did a good job. Thanks. Class, we have our first completely done pizza. Let's go hear it. All right. Sometimes when people walk into a room, they might think it's organized chaos. But I think you can tell by talking to the kids and seeing how they're relating that they're learning and learning is going on all the time. And I, I really think that as you set that fire inside of them, they will themselves continue that growth. I always say, Miss Molly has so much stuff. She wants you to learn. And she wants you to learn how to learn. When I went to school and we tried to learn all this material, well, times are changing. There's more stuff out there to learn than we can teach you. You gotta learn how to learn. This is Northview principal Dan Yunk, a native Kansan. He's not the kind of leader who spends a lot of time in his office. I do a lot of managing by walking around. I like the opportunities to interact with kids. Are you writing a story? Or you have it in your... What do you think of this computer? It's neat. Neat? Yeah. Be creative. Make this a good one. Okay? Okay. How are we doing on this? You don't like this? You look like you're doing pretty good. When Dan Young came to Northview in 1983, he found a school with low test scores, a general lack of discipline, and a dispirited faculty. One of the things that we did immediately, I think, was uh, empower people in the building. And uh, I, I may have a different idea about leadership, but I think... Uh, um, my leadership uh, develops and, and grows stronger as I empower other people. When you say uh, you empowered people, you mean you empowered teachers or students or parents or what? I think teachers especially. We weren't content with uh, what we were doing. We said, we can do better than this. This, this, isn't, this isn't the best we can do. And so we started looking at our curriculum, and, and we're in charge of that curriculum. The teachers are. For years, I think we thought the textbook was. Well, I don't want any textbook company telling us how to teach kids in Manhattan, Kansas. I want our teachers. They're our professionals. The two novel studies that I do with the Pioneer Unit is Sarah Plain and Tall and The Courage of Sarah Noble. These teachers are here on their own time at 7 in the morning to exchange ideas on how to use children's literature, not textbooks, to teach reading and other subjects. Some of the other students were reading like Blueberries for Sale, make way for ducklings. What I did is really tried to integrate across the curriculum math and the writing and the, 
the English. My kids are really into this, the books that we're doing right now, the fourth grade books that Jeannie and Kim and Sandy and I picked. They are just hot to read every minute. She stopped and smiled. That sounds funny, don't it? Still, it's true, just the same. Well, we're through with the dusters, she announced. This may sound like the Tower of Babel, but there's no confusion here. Grouped according to reading ability, kids read aloud to their partners or to themselves or discuss their book with Mrs. Miley. They are a different kind of family than we are, not just because they were in the 1920s, in the early, early 1900s, but because just the whole family structure was different than our families are, aren't they? Okay. How many people do you have in your family, Anna? Five. Five. Oh, I forgot you have an older one in high school, right? Five. Five? Four. Four. Okay. So except for Sam, we have all of us come from basically pretty small families, and even six isn't anything compared to... Twelve. Okay. What was another thing that somebody really liked in the book? I like the part where, you, where they said, like, Roadhog or something like that. What do they mean by Roadhog? I mean, like, like they're um, taking up the whole space of the road. <laughs> right. Okay. We didn't talk about Dad, about um, his brick lane. Isn't that how he kind of got into the efficiency expert? What significant thing did he do when he became the bricklayer? He made a, kind of like a scaffold, so that he w didn't have to uh, bend down and pick up each brick and put it onto the um, cement or whatever they put it together in. Okay, when you said kind of scaffolding, there was no such thing as scaffolding. He basically invented that idea. He was too fat and lazy to bend over all the time. Now, that's what they humorously say in here, but is that really what he was doing? <laughs> I don't think so, and I want you to get that point. Frank and Ernestine, kind of, they kind of poke fun at their dad. That's their style of writing in this, okay? But I don't think that that's the point. Did you notice that they said an awful lot about... Um, no reading lesson in Mrs. Miley's fourth grade is complete without integrating other subjects. Your job is going to be either to use this atlas or the great big one in the library, and we have one back on the back table that we brought in for our report. And I want you guys to start writing down and finding the places on the map that they talk about. According to Mrs. Miley's atlas, Manhattan, Kansas is a town of about 50,000 people located 200 miles due west of Kansas City. Kansas State University and Fort Riley, a U.S. Army base, are the big employers in town. Northview's families have a median income of about $20,000 a year, with 30% of them receiving some form of public assistance. Out of this working class neighborhood, 600 students come to Northview every day. What, um, what is your best subject in school? Spelling. Spelling. And yours, Sam? <laughs> You have one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I like math and spelling. Math and spelling? Um, my favorite subjects are math and reading. Math and reading? Well, my favorite subject is spelling, and I'm good at that, and I'm learning to like math better. <laughs> uh, because it's a hard, kind I of a hard subject. I hated it? math at the did beginning you? of the year. Why didn't you like math? <laughs> well, one reason was I wasn't very good at it. Yeah, that that is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> but how but how did you get good at it? Well, I didn't like it last year either, but this year <laughs> Mrs. Miley started helping me. Then what do you have to do now? Um, I have to show the number of ribbons that I to each year. Okay, let's start right here. How are you going to graph that? Well, what do you think they put? <coughs> okay, when we graph things, and when we graph things here, remember sometimes we use bar graphs, remember? Mm -hmm. What's other ways that we've shown you to, to do graphs? Besides bar graphs, what were some other ways they showed here? Line graphs. Yeah. Oh, so you just have to make your, your line from... You just have to put your dot, right? Now, connect your dots. Excellent. When I hear... Brooks say, Mom, I like this math. I get to go as fast as I want or do whatever I want. As long as I complete this, I can keep going. I think that's progress. When she comes home to do the same project that they've done as a class during the day, just because she wants to do it and show us how she did something in school that day, I say that's progress. When they want to sit and read, rather than watch three or four hours of television, I'd say that's progress.
The question is whether 10-year-old Brooke Bogue's individual progress indicates school-wide progress. Uh, what's happened, Mr. Young, to the test scores of the children here since uh, you came? In my first year, I think our scores at the sixth grade were at the 44th percentile, which was, they were totally unacceptable. And the staff knew that. Uh, um, this last year, uh, we were at the 97th percentile in all areas. Uh, in math and reading, and that's in second, fourth, and sixth grade. 97 was our lowest. We were at 100% in some of the grade levels. Uh, is discipline a problem at Northview? When I arrived, there was a few problems. So as a faculty, we met and we talked about it, and we developed a document that talked about dealing with discipline problems and, and being proactive rather than reactive. One of the discipline problems developed when kids came to school well before the doors opened at 8.30. And kids were beating each other's brains out outside and getting into uh, tussles and that kind of thing. Then they'd come inside and they'd be in rare form for learning. I mean, they would, they would be upset with each other. They'd be hurting. And so uh, I made a decision after about a day here on the job that when you come on school grounds, you're mine. So your little bike tire uh, hits uh, the Northview property or you walk on it, I want you inside. So into the gym they come an hour earlier at 7.30. You come in, uh, you can sit around and talk to your friends. I have a, a teacher, Steve Clark, that's down there uh, in the mornings with them, just talking with them. We don't have them up and running uh, around, but they can sit and visit, and they're safe. Have a good one. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day, Harley. I mean Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have, have a good, good day. One. Thank you very much, Sam. Have a good day. Few disciplinary problems and good test scores are important ways to measure a school success. But another is the richness of the curriculum. So in the heartland of America, these Kansas kids are learning Spanish four times a week, starting in the fourth grade. If there is a central theme operating at Northview, it is that learning imparted with energy and creativity can be fun. There we go again, talking about the Constitution. Take these first and fourth graders discovering American history through a play. Then later our founding fathers wrote a constitution to ensure our rights and liberties. And Like many schools across the country, teachers here work together closely. They are colleagues. But that wasn't always true at Northview, according to fifth grade teacher Julia Wolfo. Some teachers had been in um, the classroom for like 20 years and had never been in another person's classroom. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How did you break down the walls at Northview? One of the first things we did as assisting teacher, that was one of my roles. We went what, what is it? Assisting teacher. Assisting teacher. Mm -hmm. um, that was several years ago, but I went into every teacher's classroom for the very first time, and I was the person who kind of broke down the wall, as you said. Um, I had the opportunity to go in um, to observe a lesson, to help with a lesson, uh, and then I often taught for that teacher while they went and visited another classroom. We all have access to more. Joan Spiker became the second assisting teacher. Earlier, I think maybe sharing was not part of us earlier, but it is now. We share materials, we share ideas, we share lessons. Find your book, buddy. Find D, find... I think there's, yours is way up there, do you see? These kindergartners and fourth graders are looking for their buddies, kids they've been paired with on various projects throughout the year. How did that get on you? Well, that's weird, Tony. Today, the lesson begins with a clown who was invited by the teachers to entertain the students for a short time. Did I see some juggling? Yes. Yeah. 
The clown's performance is intended to inspire the kindergartners to dictate a story to their fourth grade pals. Did you like that? Then where did Adam go? Did you like the clown? Where's Adam? What did Mr. Teapot do first? What's in the back? Did he juggle or did he try to? He tried to. Okay. Mr. It's really good for any group of kids to teach somebody else that's at a different level and to realize, boy, I can do this. I understand this. And the relationship, there's a bond, a really deep bond that, that gets established by the end of the school year. What is that? A R? An R? Yep. We need to do it better. <laughs> Now we're going to go on to the next page. Now what are we going to write? Okay. And you made that we, Then we told him how to juggle. Despite being second from the bottom in state expenditures per pupil, this small town Kansas school manages to offer its students a wide range of ways to learn. Remember, with any kind of a barred instrument, you can't hold it down. It's got to be... <laughs> Yours didn't ring as much as it should, but when you practice a little bit, when you just have to lightly and get right on. This is one of those uh, coordination things. It's just two, two of one. One, two of the other. It's a brand new day, it's a brand new day, the sun is up, let's go. It's a brand new day, it's a brand new day, the sun is up, let's go. Mrs. Miley plays many roles with her fourth graders. Kickball pitcher. Woo! You've got maps here to look at. Geography you can coach. Down that big map on our graph isn't up there. You can do anything that you want to do. And the whole purpose of this is to learn as much as we can about these regions. A and unit on regions and states is typical of Mrs. Miley's teaching technique. As in life, the lines separating subjects continually cross and recross. Her lesson on geography has many goals, and one is learning about the library's card catalog system. Subject card. How do you know it's a subject card? Because it's not, it doesn't have the name of the book up there. Okay. It it's different. What's another clue that you have that it's a subject card? And it's all in capital letters. Full capital letters. Arizona, Oregon, Iowa, West Virginia, California. Minnesota, Louisiana. Louisiana fiction. Louisiana. Louisiana fiction. You want to get us? Okay. Doing research is another goal, but doing it with partners transforms what might be a dull exercise for some into an exciting expedition for all. Look at that. Oh, cool. What is it, gold? Oh, like, if you want to look up specifically state bird, how are you going to find that in the book without reading the whole thing? Go find the chapter. How are you going to find the chapters? Look in the index. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They'll put the index on here, and just like Josh just helped you, and then you'll have to turn to the next page because it's continued. Okay. Oh, okay. Corn, sweet potatoes, sugar cane, soybeans, soybeans. soybeans. S O Y C E R D E elevation the highest. Uh, so that's it. I think we're writing on the wrong piece of paper. Do you know where jazz music was born? The answer is Louisiana. Oh my gosh. There are 13 states. The next step is turning research notes into prose and picking up computer skills along the way. E-L-L-M-A-T-E. Okay, that's an editorial. It is. That's your opinion. That's not a report. Okay. Okay. Wrong. Soil that is carried by the Mississippi River and drops into the land, it is called Delta. Okay. Um, let's drop this. 
land is for them. The final stop on this trip through the states is undergoing the scrutiny of one's peers. This Many of the nation's biggest cities are in this region. It usually embarrasses most students, but not these kids. New York and Pennsylvania make chemicals and machines. There are many products made in the middle of the land. Cooperative learning teaches them to root for each other to succeed, not to fail. What is it that you want these kids of yours to get out of the fourth grade? I want them to realize that learning doesn't play, take place only in their desks and only in a book that I've provided them. I want them to know that learning takes place all year long. I want them to read. I want them to, to learn. I want them to have a good attitude about learning for the rest of their life. I think you can have a, a bad school or you can have a, uh, an ordinary school, an average school, uh, with good teachers. But to have a really good school, you need more than that. You need parents, their involvement, their support. But sometimes that's easier said than done. But there are a lot of parents out there that didn't have good experiences in school. And uh, what we were fearful of, that those would translate to their children. If they didn't feel comfortable being here, if they didn't feel like it was a good place to be, their kids would sense that. And that would hamper us in our efforts. And in order for us to have a, a true partnership between home and school, they had to buy into the school. And parents have bought into Northview. They're all over the school. As tutors, rumor. rumor, as aides, both in and out of the classroom, even as head of the computer lab, PTA President Mary Hattrum. I think there's just an attitude, uh, a very welcoming feeling uh, the minute you walk in the door from not mm -hmm. only the principal, but the teachers. They're glad to see you. Um, everybody's very welcome. That welcoming feeling. Army Major Ann Horrell and her family know it well. In 1989, the Army transferred them to Fort Riley, and they had a choice of 12 elementary schools for their son. Of course, you know, we went through and surveyed all the schools. First, we called the principals, we called the main offices, we talked to them about their curriculum base, talked to them about their teachers, talked to them about their programs, and then we talked to each individual principal and went by and saw each one of the schools and chose this one. The spirit here is, is tremendous. You, you feel it when you're, when you're in the school. They have a very dynamic principal, and he's one of the few principals, at least I've ever seen, that he knows just about every child's name. It's, it's not just the principal, it's the teachers as well. All of them really care. You're doing great. Can't stop you now. The whole staff at Northview really cares about what they're doing. They want to grow a generation that's going to do well. Tiny, that's Super. And they take the children from all of our households. We give them the best children we have, and they do their very best. And that very best is very good at Northview. Although the courts have long held that separate schools are not equal, they have recently recognized that there are school districts with too few whites to make integration feasible. This happened in Maryland's Prince George's County, so some schools there have remained predominantly black but have received additional funding as a result. You're about to visit one of these schools, 95% black, but more than equal. You can divide us. Wait a minute. Raise your hand if you are positive you know this. Oh, what do you think? 12. Okay, Daquan, let's go. Oh, 28 times 15. Very good. There is an enthusiasm about learning that can't be missed at Columbia Park Elementary. The moment you enter this school of 470 children, you realize this is an intensely focused place. There is an almost military-like precision in the way students pass through the hallways and silently signal their teachers. The idea is to minimize disruptions from the tasks at hand. At the same time, though, there is an environment of warmth and support. Excellent job. With encouraging words handed out at every opportunity. This is terrific, and it's got stickers on it and all. Could I shake each of your hands? When Pat Green became principal here in 1985, she gave a shot of adrenaline to a failing and cheerless place. Among the many changes she was to make, transforming the physical surroundings provided the quickest fix. When you walk down a hallway, if the walls are blank, 
that's a statement to a child. Nobody cares to make this environment anything other than an institution. Our school is not an institution. Our hallways are filled with pictures of children in very positive scenarios, photographs that feature children for good things, academic things. What we're doing is making sure that children are valued. Well, we stayed after school and on the weekends to work on our projects. Sixth grader Nikozi Wills is student council president and one of the school's tour guides. These are write a book awards. Each year, a child from our school enters the write a book. They have to write their own book and illustrate it. And you like that award a lot, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because each year that we've done it, we've won a first prize. This is our excellence in education banner. Mrs. Green went to the White, to the White House especially to get this banner. And we are so proud because it shows how good we really are. Awards abound mostly due to the big improvement on standardized test scores. For $25, 5 into 25 is 5, so you multiply 5 times 8. Math scores show the biggest turnaround. 6 into 17. Seven years ago, only half the students were achieving at or above grade level. Now, more than 90% do. What kind of triangle is this triangle? That shouldn't be surprising after watching Rosemary McConaughey teach geometry to a combined fifth and sixth grade class. Jesse Ann, give him a hand. What three choices can he pick from? Um, scanning, isosceles, and equilateral. All right. You have very good scaling. How'd you know it was scaling? It's scaling because all three uh, of the um, triangular lines mm -hmm. that make it aren't equal. And what else is not equal? To match um, the degrees inside of it. How would you solve for the missing angle, Antoine? Add up 60 and 30, 35. All right, what would the radius of this circle be, Danielle? 3 and 4 tenths. Very good. How did you get that? I divided by 2. Very good. How did you know to do that? Because it was radius. And what part of a radius is the diameter? Half. Very good. I truly celebrate in my students' achievements. It just makes me feel so good inside. There's, there's nothing, nothing better to me that I could be doing with my life. Nothing. And I want you to know how very proud I am of everything that uh, you do every day in this school, where, where we think that Columbia Park is just, just the best of the best. The best the is best. what Dr. John Murphy, superintendent of 172 schools in Prince George's County, has been striving for since he took office in 1984. Our goal was to take Prince George's County, a 65% minority school system, a school system that had been failing, and within a five-year period of time, make it competitive with Montgomery County, Fairfax County, the finest school systems in America, to prove once and for all that public education could serve all of America's children. Columbia Park serves a poor and working-class black community just outside Washington, D.C., in Landover, Maryland. Garden apartments and single-family homes many with multiple families living behind the doors, are wedged between strip malls. Sixty percent of the families receive public assistance. Most of the children walk to school, often through areas where there have been drug and crime problems. Despite these heavy odds, the community is fighting back. In most urban settings, and Prince George's County is an urban setting, people think that children fail because of the failures that children bring with them when they come to school or the problems they bring with them. Uh, and unfortunately, we oftentimes blame race uh, on failure or failure on race. And, and we certainly didn't want to continue that myth in public education. That myth was a reality to third grade teacher Gail Anderson. She grew up in a tough Southeast Washington neighborhood and recalls her own third grade teacher. I'll never forget. Um, this one teacher who stood in front of the class and called the whole class um, a bunch of ignorant children. And um, she would always call us stupid. And it was just something about that. And I never wanted another child to experience that. Are you going to do your best? Yes. Do you feel good about yourself? Yes. 
Miss Anderson, also an ordained minister, has a mission. Tell your neighbor to keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. What happens in this class is the embodiment of what makes this school successful. I love it, T.T. Good work, Nakia. Good behavior is always noticed. How much is this coin worth? Kevin. Mm -hmm. I love it, and you're right. Correct answers are rewarded and applauded. Now I'm going to put some money on the screen, and I want you to tell me how much money I have in my change purse. And if the answers don't come easily, the student is never humiliated. Plus 25, 60. Wait a minute, 50 plus 25 is 60? 70. That's still not correct, sweetheart. Keon, Miss Anderson, I want you to stop right now. And I want you to listen to me. Do you want someone to come up here and help you? You can still stand right here with me. You want to do it on your own. You have a choice. Okay, he would like for someone to come up to help you. Keon like is given time and support place. by the teacher and by the class. And you can all help by sitting in good sitting position and having good thoughts for Keon and Shakia as they work out this problem. Okay, we have 50, and then we have 25. Okay, very good. Okay, keep going. You can do it. A dollar. Okay, keep going. dollar 25. Mm-hmm. A dollar. Dollar. Help him, Shakia. Your contact is 74. Okay. So even if a student stumbles, he's never allowed to fall. Ten, mm -hmm. ten, quarter, mm -hmm. 26, 27, 28. Thank you for not giving up. I appreciate that. I have something for both of you, but you need to say something to Shakia. Thank you, Shakia. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's what it's all about, helping each other. I appreciate it. The faith teachers have in all their students is welcomed by parents. Mommy. Donna McDonald, a single working mother with two daughters at Columbia Park. They make them be proud of who they are. They make them feel like, try it. You can do it, try it. Um, my daughters tell me all the time, if I keep trying it, I'll do it, Mommy. Oh, you can do it. I think that that's good for a child. The weaving of family into a child's school life is a crucial element in rescuing troubled schools according to Yale child psychiatrist James Comer. Very good. His ideas, known as the Comer process, have been adopted by more than 120 poor and minority schools across the country, including Columbia Park. So when Pat Green arrived here, armed with Comer's guidelines, one of her first moves was to meet with small groups of parents. Just talking and interacting and sharing and telling me things that they didn't like. Parents didn't feel as if the school allowed them to be involved. And they said that to me, you know, up front. We don't feel welcome to Columbia Park. But her discussions continued, and parents began to see their school in a new light. Winston Rhodes drives 16 children, including four of his own, to and from school every day. Have a good day at school. <laughs> Study hard. I think the school, since Ms. Green's been there, has opened their hands out to them and give them a chance to come in to get involved. And when you open a door for someone to get involved in schools, you take more interest. You want to get involved. And gradually we started building and working with that, encouraging parents to really become a partner and not just in, in name only. Parents are now bona fide partners at Columbia Park. The next word is opposite. They're paid teacher's aides. Park. They're volunteer tutors. Fetch house. Yeah. But most importantly, they're decision makers. Certificate. You know, something to place on the wall. They serve on two different Comer design committees, which govern the academic, social, and teaching policies of the school. Responsibilities are shared by the principal, teachers, staff, and parents. When your parents are involved, you do better. You know, you, you know, that support, that support, family support, along with your teacher's support, which all becomes like a family, you do better, you excel better. This circle of support is at the heart of the Comer plan. Mom's going to be proud of you. Are you proud of you? 
A second goal of the Comer process is for schools to help remedy the poor self-image many students bring to class. See you tomorrow. Real good. Yeah, real good. So at Columbia Park, dispensers of praise and positive reinforcement are constantly on the loose. Good work. I'm proud of you. You should be proud of yourself. Red, very good for art. Real good? Excellent. Raymond, for day to day? Good. When things get tough, you do not give up. Good work, Eddie. Love it. I like the way you're working together. Very good. Keep up the great work, boys and girls. Super boys and girls, you're doing a great job. Everybody Isn't there a danger that uh, you give them too much praise? Uh, people sometimes tease me because I'm out there every day and I'm thanking the youngsters for not running across the street. And I have no problem with that at all because I feel it's important to let people know those things which we value and those things which are important. And as you're going home and playing in the neighborhood, Pat Green uses the PA system at the end of the day to bolster students' good behavior. I want you to think what it's like when somebody picks on you or messes with you. And you all know what I mean when I say messes with you. Remember to be proud of who you are and respect each other. All this reinforcement yields results. Uh, we don't have major discipline problems, and yet there used to be very serious discipline problems in the school. Suspensions used to average 30 a year. Now they're down to two. These kids know what's expected of them. Rules of behavior are clearly displayed and consistently enforced. More serious problems are mediated by a full-time guidance counselor. The idea is to maximize the learning time by keeping students concentrated. I have two coins in my hand, and I have 26 cents. What two coins do I have in my hand? Delesta? Delesta caught daydreaming. Delesta, do you know what Miss Anderson just asked you? I want to thank Why did you come to school this morning? To learn. Are you learning? <laughs> so what should you do? Thank you. I want to see improvement. For two, please repeat that. Being singled out is always painful. But later in the day, Delesta does make a change, and Miss Anderson makes sure the whole class knows it. You know, I want to stop right now because I've been watching Delesta, and I love the improvement. And that's, that's what makes you a winner. When you realize that you've made a mistake, and now I'm going to do better. And I want to say to Lester from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the improvement. You deserve a smile, sweetheart. Good work. Keep it up. Okay, now what I would like to do... We tell them constantly that they can do anything that they set their minds to, that they have that capability, that we're here to help them attain their goals. And I think that having that belief, if they hear it often enough, it becomes internalized. And then they're, they're ready. They are equipped with the social and academic skills that are necessary to function out in the world. Tell me about the school that you went to and how it compares with Columbia Park. I wish the schools I went to were like Columbia Park because I would feel I would have sailed better in different things. And I would have more avenues. You know, Columbia Park gives you avenues, you know. You, you know their teachers are encouraging, my, like my daughters, you can be a lawyer, you know, I didn't have that, you know, it was this basic ABC education. I want you to remember that you are somebody and you can be anything that you want to be. I want to be um, an artist. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a singer. I want to be a teacher. I'm going to be a lawyer. A lawyer? Detective. A fashion designer. A hairstylist. I want to be a doctor. Students' ambitions are ignited by a school that has found its vision. Please. How about Vermont? 
my pain. But the vision wasn't always so focused, according to Mrs. McConaughey, who has taught here for 16 years. Our school did not have clear set goals as to what we wanted for our children. And as such, you had the program was fragmented. Now there is a school-wide plan that covers both teaching techniques and subject matter. What else did he use? Sliding, sliding joint. Take science, for example. While the fifth and sixth well, graders are learning about bones in the body... We're going to be talking about the human brain. The third graders are studying the brain. We are going to play a game of tic-tac-toe. Simon says... Wave your carpals and phalanges of the fingers. Familiar childhood games are often says, used to make a lesson clavicle. review fun. Simon says, touch your clavicle. Simon says, touch your mandible. Mm -hmm. The skull bones do not protect the brain. True or false? Tell uh, False. Okay, you're right. Right first. Ladies, the two kinds of memory are the short time memory and the long time memory. True or false? I want to see more discussion. Shakia. True. Very good. Simon says, touch your coccyx. Simon says, touch your ulna. Your brain is made up of five parts. False. The brain is pinkish. Shakia? True. Right. The brain is always working for you. Tyrone? True. Okay, in the only place. You all deserve a hand. Good work. Tie game. Tic-tac-toe tests the memories of students. Okay, we have physical appearance. It weighs three pounds. It's pinkish gray. We have one memory. For their comprehension, Miss Anderson uses charts to help organize their thoughts. Learning. Takes place solving problems and thinking. Give me something else, Marcus. Short time memory. Short time memory. It's called webbing because the charts look like spider webs. When I asked you yesterday, I said we're going to. And Mrs. About McConaughey uses the same oh. technique to give her students both a visual and mental picture of what they've read. I'd like for you to summarize in several sentences. Shakia, give us what a have statement. You learned about the brain? I have learned today about the brain that the brain is pinkish gray. Reading comprehension test scores have lagged behind okay. other subjects. What was the warning? You have to read. So new teaching methods are always being tried. Going to be talking about We're changing brain. our strategies. Rather than focusing on the children, we're saying what can we do better to help show improvement for the children because we're the key as educators to success for the children. For example, to teach these kids more than just classroom basics. All those approve of the minutes, please answer by saying I. To teach them social and leadership skills, Columbia Park has an active student council with precise parliamentary procedures. Well, just keep it for like the primary. Is there anyone who would like to second or Sean's motion? I second his motion. It's a motion. Oh, a motion. A motion. All those in favor of Sean's motion, please answer by saying aye and raise your hand. Aye. Okay, that's two. All who oppose, please answer by saying nay. Nay. What's the school done for you? What do you think about uh, Columbia Park Elementary? This school teaches you to, when you go out in society, to become a productive citizen and to be active in the community and, and help out. And this school teaches you to respect people. And it, it teaches you to um, be mindful of the things you do. And do you agree with that? Yeah. And I also think that this school teaches you to fight for what you believe in. This school has taught me how to be a productive leader. What we're trying to do is to build foundations. If the foundation is strong enough, you can build from that. And that's what we're attempting to do, to make a very strong foundation so that children will be able to continue to build on those experiences with pride, with self-esteem, and with success. It was a super day. And again, I want to say thank you 
for doing your best. And I love you. Keep shining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 We'll be back in a moment with the stories of two more elementary schools that work. Need a jury fine. Lobby Jocelyn. Guilty as charged. Court is adjourned. First, a place where learning is rooted in the real world. Way to go, Roger Rabbit! And then, a school where poor Hispanic kids are beating the odds. Coming up after this break. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Learning in America is solely funded by the Chrysler Corporation in the belief that only a quality education will keep America competitive today and tomorrow. The divisions of Chrysler are Chrysler, Plymouth, Dodge, Dodge Trucks, Jeep, and Eagle. This is PBS the Public Broadcasting Service. Advances in molecular genetics, what do they mean for us? For our children? For the planet? No previous generation has had greater influence over its own biological destiny, nor greater responsibility for its future. Web of life the next Smithsonian World Special. Pedaling from the Pampas to Patagonia, Tom Vernon explores Argentina with humor and good grace. A different kind of adventure. A fat man goes gaucho. Next on Adventure. Learning in America continues. Here again is Roger Mudd. One frequent complaint about public schools is their failure to make schoolwork relevant to the real world. In the old New England mill town of Lowell, Massachusetts, the city magnet school turns relevance into a virtue, making connections between the real world and the classroom throughout the day. Only nine years old and still controversial. Lowell's Micro Society School is the only school of its kind. I want to come out here all this. But I ain't counting. One thousand eight. Oh, that's that's how much I have in the bank book and how much in un unsold newspapers. I hereby move that the government pay us. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. From what you saw, did Sarah make a fist at Lori? How does it feel to be a witness on that witness stand? What's going on here? How much? 250. The translation of an old axiom. Experience is the best teacher. What were you doing when this happened? In Lowell, Massachusetts, one school blends learning and hands-on doing in an unusual way. Call it society in miniature. Here you go. The city magnet school is, in fact, called a micro-society school. Students each afternoon run their own grassroots, democratic, free market society. They all have jobs, earn money, pay tuition, and taxes. So now the question is, what do we do with these percents? Traditional classes are still the foundation. The Here, for four hours a day, kids acquire the basic skills. For example, one-fourth would be what over a hundred? Anybody? Norm Charette is Fantastic. teaching these sixth graders Which economy, also known as arithmetic. Good. How can you use the uh, percents? Either here in the micro, at home. All right, Sasha? In the bank, when they give you interest. When they give you interest, and we think it's 5%. So what would 5% as a decimal be? A lesson on percents is immediately applied in the micro society, or micro, as they refer to it here. Micro has its own banks, businesses, and currency, called Mogans, named for a former superintendent, Patrick Mogan. This is the central, central bank to the side of the... Isaac manages the central bank, 
a kind of federal reserve. Well, we have accounts for mostly teachers. They have money in here? Yes, from the money that they, that they collect from their um, rent and tuition. Oh, you mean each child pays tuition here? Yeah, tuition and rent, each person, it's 40 million. How much interest do you pay? Five, um, 5%. 5%. And if they took out a loan, they owe us 10%. The Micro Society School was the brainchild of a New York educator named George Richmond. His idea came to life in 1981 when a group of teachers and administrators in Lowell created the City Magnet School. Principal Sue Ellen Hogan arrived just last year. She marvels at what's been accomplished here. Well, the usual way in education is that we all sit around and we talk about how we don't like things or what's wrong with the schools and what, and to see a group take an idea of how to make schools better and to really bring it about, that I think is really commendable. What makes this book kind of a grabber? You want to know what, what's is the secret about the guy? All right. Yeah. At this school, 330 students from kindergarten through eighth grade have a real motivation to learn the micro society. What is it that you like about this school? Micro. 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 Get married from micro. Close everything up. Micro fills one Isn't period each day after regular classes. That's when students go to their jobs. Mark is a bailiff in the school's court system. Starshell is a bank clerk. And Waldemar is in theater production. Singing telegrams are his specialty. All these jobs, I think, the main idea is you no, know, it's directed to how the real life is out there. The whole purpose of micro is to get us ready for the real world. When we go out and we have to work, we'll already be way ahead of everybody else who hasn't had the micro society, because we'll, we'll have some idea of what it's going to be like. I call this meeting to order. Please be quiet and be seated. Right. This is the legislature, where students ideas, learn to regulate their society, to govern themselves. The fourth and fifth and sixth graders have worked on school projects where they can recycle and go out and clean up the neighborhood around the school. We're going to get a bag either in the cafeteria or in the atrium. So if you have full ca empty cans, uh, please recycle them and don't throw them away. Will we have signs posted so that students are aware that we are going to be recycling the cans? With faculty and, uh, guidance, the legislature right, adopts remember. budgets, levies taxes, and oh. enacts laws. Not voting passes April. Um, how many people have been paid by the government so far? Have they been being paid regularly? Nope. No. no. I, I want to make a motion that we be paid because I haven't been paid in at least three months now. We're making laws and everything, and we're not even getting paid. We're doing our share around here, and we're not getting anything for okay, it. What, what's your motion? Are you giving me an argument with the motion? Just one thing at a time. Okay. I hereby move that the government pay the legislature what they owe. These kids are passionate about their politics. Civics isn't just a part of the curriculum here, it's a part of everyday life. When this Whiskey Rebellion happened... Patty Manning is a member of the team that teaches the sixth grade. The rebellion consisted of one tax collector approached one farmer who was a little bit more irritable than the rest. And he kind of lost his cool and he took out a musket and he shot at him. Picture this now. Tim, you are a farmer in the West, okay? I am a tax collector. I come out to you and I say, Farmer Shea, you grow all this wheat, which we know you make into whiskey. We are going to charge you a tax. What are you going to say to me? No way. <laughs> what could be a routine history lesson on the Whiskey Rebellion becomes an opportunity to reinforce the connection between academics and life. Okay. In this school, we have a tax department, don't we? Called the what? IRS. Why do they collect taxes? To run all these government offices. What do you think? Is it necessary to have these government offices? Yeah. Is it valuable for us to have a court system? Yes. yes. Why? In case something happens that two people disagree about, well, 
Two people oh. can disagree. So people can have their just justice. Have their justice. So there won't be as many fights like after school and stuff. Okay, so the court system works. We don't mind paying taxes then to support that, do we? What about the taxes themselves, Internal Revenue Service? What is the tax rate here per citizen? Oh. Star. Fifteen Mogans? Fifteen Mogans what? A week. A week. Do you think that the tax rate of fifteen Mogans per student in the city magnet school is a just and fair tax? I don't. Why? Because we have to pay tuition rent for 40 million, and then if we have 15 million, then we get 55, and we're only going to have 45 million left out of our check if we like just get 100. Who's a government employee? What's your salary? 100 million a week. Can you think of any way we could change it? What could we do? Print more money. Print more money. That would be good, but I mean, you have to have something to back it up with. Lower taxes? Lower taxes? How is that going to pay? The government people the government. will be back in debt again. Think about back in those days, okay? Did the United States government need money to run the government? Yeah. yeah. Did they have a right yeah. to tax the farmers yeah. for the whiskey? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Who said no? What? That was your bread and butter. That was their bread and butter. So the, did the government have a right to step in and do something about it. Yeah, yeah but not tax their whole living. Not that's tax their whole living? Yeah, because that, that's, that's the way they got that that their money that? and trading and everything. So once I set the historical background for the Whiskey Rebellion, I connected it with Micro, and we got into a discussion about the tax system, and, well, what do you think? Is it necessary? What does it do? And they realize that it is the heart of the school that if we didn't have the government and the taxes to pay the government workers and run everything, there wouldn't be a micro society. That you have to have support from the people to make a group work together. We can decide what we want to buy that fits our... That is the our essence school. of this school. Not only for students, but teachers and parents as well. They share equal power with the principal. The best way to run a school, from my view anyway, is to involve those who have to carry out policy and making policy, to consult people and involve them. They become very loyal, they become extra hard workers, and it's a much better atmosphere for everyone. The school's harmonious atmosphere exists amid the hubbub of downtown Lowell. And in fact, because this is a magnet school, it must mirror the ethnic mosaic of the city. 60% white and 40% minority made up of Hispanics, Blacks, Southeast Asians, and Indians, but all admitted on a first-come, first-served basis. Lowell's population is about 100,000. This old industrial New England urban center is mostly working class, but with large pockets of poverty as well. And a sordid slice of life is on daily view in the streets and parks of Lowell. I go to park sometimes, like during the summertime, and it's like about... Uh, there's a guy that's a drug dealer, and he sits on the bench every single day that I go. He's sitting there on the bench, and he's selling drugs. So you're, you're aware of the stuff going on? Oh, yeah. You know, by my house, that, that they do a lot of drugs around there. As soon as they see a car, they run up to it, and there's fights over there about drugs sometimes and everything. Well, you um, look out your, your window and see it going on? Yeah. So I was walking back to the house, when all of a sudden, something pulled me into the car, my friends. And I noticed that they were drunk, and they were going about 80 miles down the road. I was scared because they were headed to a tree. I said to myself, is this my destiny? And someone said yes, because you made a big mistake and went with your drunk friends and got in with, into an accident. One accident. Or friends. I don't remember anything. He said, of course you're dead. Oh, wow. What an ending. Of course, you're dead. That was a good story that we could work on. Yolanda. The sixth graders write stories that bring the stark realities of their outside world right into Lois Cullen's English class. And I think through what we do on a daily basis, instilling them with that, that concept that they make the difference in their lives, no matter what is happening, in spite of what is happening, they can change. In the mansion in the Secret Garden, how many rooms are there? 
hundred rooms. One door opens up a hundred rooms. What's behind the door? Like a kitchen, <coughs> like living quarters. They've been reading The Secret Garden by Francis Burnett. In the book, destiny is a mystery that waits behind a door. There were doors and doors, and there were pictures on the wall. What is destiny? What your life is going to be like, where you think you're going to end up. So that could be your destiny. What is that garden? Why is it a secret? She might um, learn something about her past that they don't want her to learn. Her past? Like her family's past. Would you describe Mary as totally obnoxious? She gets on people's nerves, the way she acts. What did Martha do? What did Martha do? That was funny. She goes, who are you calling names? <laughs> who are you calling names? You like that Yorkshire? <laughs> You're getting into that. As they right, read and analyze the novel, they themselves the begin to open do doors do and I explore their own destiny. In the process, they develop into imaginative storytellers. Get ready. You are now about to go to a door that you now have to open. What's behind the door is up here. Soon it will be on your paper. Good writers don't tell. What do they do? Show. They show things. When you open that door, use your metaphors to show me what you see. Go with it. Do anything you want with it. Just write. Day two. They've completed a first draft of their stories. All right, I want you to go now with one another and help one another. Now Mrs. Cullen has them work together in small groups. See, I finally... share what they saw when they opened the door. I want to be able to see it in your writing. I realized it was just a dream. Finally, they must when stand and deliver. And went through the middle door. Reading a finished okay. story to the whole class. The These kids seem eager to room share room not only their writing, but also the their dreams. The ball popped out of his hands. I saw myself in this awesome house. I was sipping champagne out of a crystal glass with a ravishingly beautiful woman. I suppose she was my wife. Then the man with the glowing eyes walked up to me and asked, Would you like, would you like to live like this? I answered swiftly, Yes, I'd love to. Then you must change, he said. You must go to school and go to college, but if you choose to refuse me, you will end up like this. Instantly, the big mansion zipped away and I saw a street corner, a dark, gloomy street corner. I saw a homeless person sitting down, guzzling booze out of a paper bag. I saw the man. Is that me? Yes, he answered. If you don't do what I told you, you'll end up like him. I woke up to the sound of my alarm clock. And from that night on, I went to school and passed college. And in 23 years, I was a rich lawyer with a beautiful wife. That was excellent. Timmy, that was a good, you did a great job on that. What did you like, Holly? I like how he described, said that it was a beautiful woman, and then he woke up to his alarm clock, and he went to school, and he passed college and everything. Amanda, you had your hand up. Did you want to add what you liked about Timmy's story? Yeah, I liked it because it was had a lot of detail. And how he switched scenes and from a mansion to a street corner. It was great. You changed your destiny. Your destiny frightened you. And you didn't want to be the person that you saw. You could change that. If we don't like where we are, if we don't like what's happening, we can change that. Is it harder to teach at a micro society school than it would be at a traditional school? I think it's a lot harder. Do you? I think the teachers have to work very hard because they're creating the program. They're writing the curriculum. They're creating the activities. 
So the program is always being adjusted and modified according yeah, to how well it goes with the children. Yes. Does that mean what you're doing today is going to be published? No. Uh -huh. How do you apply well, English to micro? The answer is publishing. The basic skills that students acquire in class are honed as they write, edit, lay out, and produce newspapers, magazines, and the yearbook. Don Hayes supervises the Micro Society's newsroom. I teach publishing, not English, because it's a combination of journalism and social studies as well as English. So instead of teaching kids just creative writing, I teach them how to write a hard news article, which is information organized so that somebody else can read it, understand it, and the editorials, which is expressing your opinion, which I consider vital. They also compose research reports, interviews, and critical reviews. And of course, they sell their work for real moguls, because what's a publication without subscribers? Any circulation wars set off in this room? We have had circulation wars, not currently, but I've had in the past circulation wars. And in fact, last year was one boy started up a uh, newspaper that and it was a, new, a newspaper and a magazine combined, entertainment magazine, sold like crazy and ended up buying out everybody else in the room and forming a conglomerate. You can sell them, we'll defend you. Your, your business the Micro Society could not flourish without the help of parents like Steve Dixon, a father with three children of his own in the school. A self-employed computer consultant, Dixon spends two hours a day supervising the micro economy. Can you tell me in a word or two why you think this school is so special. The first word that comes to mind seems to have nothing to do with the Micro Society School. It's, it's heart. It's got a lot of heart. Hi. Roberta Menzies also has three children, including Starshell. A single mother, she's trying to do it all, and says the Micro Society School is her partner as a parent. They get a lot of support from the teachers. They get a lot of support and I get a lot of support. So we're working together. It's like a team, I don't know. I think I look at it as if we're a family. The school, the teachers, the students, the parents. We all work together. The parents have to sign the kids' homework. I think that is great. That's wonderful. Because a lot of times the kids either don't get it done or they have someone else do it. We're going to look at your homework right now to be sure you're doing this correctly. If I'm not satisfied with it, they tell you don't sign it. What percent is six C's money supply? That seemingly simple homework system helped transform Starshell's grades. You said, Starshell, that you were having trouble with math. Yeah, math, yeah, because math here is more harder than like it is at the other school I was at. So are your grades getting better in math? How are you doing? Yeah, now I get back into the A's and like a couple of B's. Starshell's academic progress is characteristic of the Micro Society School. Students consistently test above grade level in both math and English, but they're also absorbing an array of skills and information that cannot be measured by standardized tests. For example, you do know that the lawyer has learned the Constitution and the laws when they conduct a court case, or you do know that someone has learned about publishing when you look at the product, the newspaper, the magazine that they publish. And you do know that a business manager has learned accounting principles and how to manage a business if the ledger is up to date. So how much, uh, let me see your book, how much have you made today? We, we made 2,000. Already today? And, and week, you just been open 20 minutes? Yeah. This week we made like 12,000. Make no mistake about it, these kids know how to run a business. They manufacture and market buttons, posters, pins, string art, and a motley assortment of crafts. What is that? Would that be like an ashtray or something? No, candy dish. Candy dish. I thought I made an ashtray, but some kids here broke it. We cracked it by accident. And how much is that? That's 2200 The kids already buy it, and I'm just putting it on display. This is sold already? Yeah. 200 mogul. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, it's not a magnet. They think it's a lot of mogul, but it's not. No, actually, if you think about how much, if you think about how much it takes to make the thing, you know, how much it costs to buy the play and stuff, it's not really that much. When you go to micro, do you have a feeling you're just sort of playing store? No, I no. think I think I'm, I'm like doing a real job. I'm doing a real job there. Most people take it seriously. Mm -hmm. I take it real seriously. I think the thing that we try to do differently here is that we really don't want it to be a false type of uh, 
play school. We really want it to be a society. And the interaction they have, the social skills that they learn, the negotiating skills that they learn, the, the, the people skills that they learn, are things that have been very easy for us to see in, in our children. Even in this school, children sometimes get into trouble. But as you might expect, in the micro-society, discipline is usually meted out by the kids themselves. In this case, on this in day, court. Laurie Beth Jocelyn was committing a crime when she scratched Sarah. She used a clipboard as a weapon. This is the case of Sarah versus Laurie. You see this clipboard? What did Lori do? She went like that. Did it you on your head? Uh-huh. And did it hurt you? Kind of. Your Honor, may I approach my witness? Mm -hmm. Could you please show me exactly what she did with it? She went like that. No further questions. Lori, exactly what happened on December 4th? Me and Sarah were doing this paper, and we were going to do it separate and then show each other. So um, I was doing it, and Sarah wanted to see it. And I got mad, and I said, no, no, you can't see it. But she took it, and I got real mad, and I got mad, and I pinched her and hit her. Cross-examination? Well, you've admitted to pinching her and scratching her. Do you want me to hitting her over the head with the clipboard? I hit her on the clipboard because she took my paper, and then after that, she wouldn't give it back to me, so I hit her with the clipboard, but I didn't hit her hard. So you hit her over a piece of paper? Yeah. Legally, did you have a right to do that? No. No further questions, Your Honor. It didn't take the jury long to deliberate over this case. Did the jury find Laurie Jocelyn guilty as charged? The punishment for the crime was 500 mogans in damages. Court is adjourned. In Lowell, justice and equality and responsibility are not abstract concepts. They are tangible because the point of the City Magnet School is to give these kids an early and accurate sense of the world they are about to enter. In fact, this micro-society sees itself as a model for the macro-society. Ethnic differences, cultural differences, intellectual differences, the group of children that our children are exposed to here are really diverse in all kinds of ways, and that's a, that's a very healthy environment, I think, very much like we'd like to see society work. In some ways, we recreate society. In some ways, I'd like to think we're preparing students who will go out and change some of the things that are not positive about our society. I hereby move that the City Magnet School should start... I think by giving students an idea of how institutions run, that they are going to be empowered when they leave to think that these are not static institutions and laws, and that they have seen the inside of a legislature and the inside of a courtroom and the inside of a bank, and that they will be empowered to change these institutions to benefit themselves and other people when they are adults. No further questions. When you try to turn around a school that has consistently failed the students from its poor minority neighborhood, you start by going back to the basics. That's what happened eight years ago at the Lozano Special Emphasis School in Corpus Christi, Texas. Today, Lozano stands as an example of how structure and discipline lovingly applied can overcome even the most staggering obstacles. Seven twenty-five, twenty-five past seven. Seventy-seven degrees and partly cloudy. When is the Corpus Christi? Going to be another beautiful day on the Texas Riviera. Hispanics, 20 million strong, the fastest growing ethnic minority in our population. With their background of poverty, illiteracy, and language barriers, most Hispanic children do not do well in American public schools. But there are always exceptions, and one of the most startling is the Lozano Special Emphasis School here in Corpus Christi, Texas. You need your pencils out? 
And you're going to work as a team. Sit up, talk, same team. In put on Barbara my Purcell's back first back grade back. class, all pencils are poised okay. for a lesson in vocabulary. We're going to write as many words in 10 minutes as you can come up with that have the t sound, the letter T. We're going to be a fun team and we're going to work as a team. All right, begin. Turn around your chairs, get ready. Timmy, T and T. T and T. Let everybody have a turn. Teenagers, let 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 Paddle Taylor is a good one. You guys are coming up with big words. You're not even coming with the small ones. You're taking huge words. Big words. Thirteen is a good one. Table. Nicholas. Gee, where are you getting all these words? Good job for you. Time's up. You need to count how many words you have. And then everybody needs to be in their learning position and ready to tell me so we can see which group had the most words. All right, get them all. How did the Ninja Turtles do? Um, Fine, well, how many? 34. 34, all right. Five words that no one else has named. Trevor. You guys are on the ball. Teach. Teach. Tigers. Tigers. Team. Time. Excellent. Which team won? The Roger Rabbits. With how many words? 40 words. Don't you think we need to get, tell them, let's put our two thumbs up, and let's tell them, way to go, Roger Rabbit. One, two, three. Way to go, Roger Rabbit. Eight years ago, it was hard to find anything to cheer about at Lozano. In a district with 38 elementary schools, they ranked third from the bottom until 1982, when Principal Maggie Ramirez stepped in to turn things around. For such so many years, the achievement had been so low, so it had been accepted as the norm. Her first challenge was attendance, just getting these kids to school. Ramirez took to the airwaves. She went on Spanish language radio every morning, haranguing parents. Here was basically an intruder coming into their homes, you know, an intruder coming in on their radio station, telling them, get your kids up, send them to school, feed them breakfast. They didn't understand what we were all about. Today, attendance is close to perfect, 98%. For 500 poor Mexican-American kids, Lozano has become a crucible of learning. We, the Lozano team, hereby pledge... And Principal Ramirez and is the fuel that keeps know, it hot. We want to know from you whether the teachers kept the promises or not. Did they make sure that you learn all your timetables and all your reading material and all that, did they? Yeah. Okay. We have to convince them that every one of them could learn. And they have. We have proven that they can and they have. One, two, three, show me. It's amazing how these children not only survive, but are able to excel under the circumstances that they're faced with in this type of a community. Corpus Christi is a city of 270,000 situated along the Gulf Coast in South Texas. 52% of the population here is Hispanic. Lozano students inhabit a neighborhood that is shabby and tough, plagued with drugs, crime, and unstable family life. Tell me about your family. Who lives at your house? Me, my mother, and my brother, and my sister, and I have five cousins and five, um, five other cousins. And don't you also live with your grandmother? So your grandmother is part of your family. You have a huge family. Not like everybody else, you have a huge family. A lot of you living together in the same house. Adrian, who lives in your family? Me, my sister, my uncle, and my mom. Okay, so you only have one parent in your house, right? Your mom? Does anybody in here live just with their father? Jose, you live just with your father? Your mother doesn't live with you? Mm. Are you the only child in your family, or do you have other brothers and sisters? Yeah, brothers, but dad often tells my mom. Oh, so you're the only one who lives with your dad and your other brothers live with your mom? Mm -hmm. Do you get to see your mom very often? Sometimes. Splintered families are a fact of life in this community. That can make it hard to focus on academics. Sometimes it takes a visit from the principal to keep the kids on track. So Ramirez and community aide Mary Munguia regularly knock on doors. 
It was in December, right? Right before Christmas. Yeah, with our yeah. presents and food uh -huh. and stuff, right? Did you enjoy that? Right? We want uh, for Julio to go to summer school. Uh, he qualifies for summer school because he needs additional help in math. Mm -hmm. And we really would like for him to go because uh, summer school will help him have a better year next year. And it's, uh, it'll be provided free for him. So we really would like for you to take advantage of that. Julio, once you get in summer school and things are not going well, I'll be there and, and I'll try and help you with any anything or so any questions that you have. Okay? Okay? And you're going to do okay. a good job, I know. I know. I'm proud of you. And I'm so proud of you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll see you again. A lot of times these students have come from pretty bad home situations. And they come to school and this is where they feel safe, they feel secure, mm -hmm. they feel love, they feel respect. And I'll never forget this one student raised his hand and he said, uh, Miss Torres, uh, I have a lot of problems too. He said, uh, sometimes we don't have anything to eat at home. And my mother says, just wait, just wait. We're going to get something to eat later, just wait. He says, but when I get to school, I feel so good when I get here that before I walk into the door, I just tell myself up here and I remember that little face. He was a little third grade, eight years old. He says, I just tell myself in my, my mind, I'm going to do okay because now I'm here and now everybody cares about me. Don't you think we need to give Juan a big hand, let him know how proud we are? Good. And how do you feel about being student of the day? Making kids feel secure at school is one way to compensate for family chaos. Bringing order into their lives is another. I'd like for all of you to very patiently leave your things on your desk and try not to touch them. At Lozano, when they say special emphasis, they mean heavy-duty structure and high expectations. We'll start with you. Belinda Carreño teaches fifth grade. First of all, it's our discipline plan. We have cafeteria rules that you have to follow. Otherwise, you have consequences. Hall rules, school rules. And that starts day one, as soon as you walk in my room. Be a question asker. Be an energizer. Get your group going. We want to see that. We just expect things from them. For example, we expect them to behave, we expect them to do their homework, we expect them to be on time, and we expect them to always try their best. Use great vocabulary, right? You're talking to? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I got it. And in turn, teachers here try their best to make learning exciting. Chicken, please. Sometimes magical and always fun. Welcome aboard Lozano One. I am Commander Purcell, your shuttle commander. And guess where we're going? To space. Lozano 1, this is Houston Control. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Who should control? Five, four, three, two, one. Earth. <laughs> look way over there. Do you see Earth? I want you to look at Earth. This is Earth. But I want you to notice, what shape is Earth? Round. Round. It's a round. This is the United States. Do you see that they have writing on this globe? Yes. Do you think that they really have writing when you go up in, the, in outer space? Now, I want you to listen to my question. And you're looking out the window. Do you think they have a sign that blinks on and goes, United States, United States, United States, United States? Oh. Or Africa, 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 Africa? Oh. No. So you just have to kind of look. There is no way that you can see. I want to show you what the Earth looks like from the space shuttle. That is what Earth looks like from space. We will go to you. whatever extreme That's it takes. It if it means like staying space. after school, if it means helping the child one-on-one, -on -one, talking and finding a new idea, a new technique that's going to reach that child, we just don't give up. We try to make sure that every child learns something during the day and that they have something positive. What do you notice in this picture? Amanda, do you notice the trees and the cars? No. No, what do you notice? I want the people to tell me. What do we notice? The water. The water. Jose, what else are we going to notice? Clouds. We're going to notice a lot of clouds. Terrific. Jason, what else are we going to notice? 
Um, stars are big and round. Are you ready to end your orbit? Yes, yes, we are! Welcome back, everyone. Thank you, Houston Control. Thank you, Houston Control! Soaring through space, the Earth appears to be theirs for the taking. Anything seems possible. In the real world, where life often conspires to put them down, Lozano builds them up with galactic doses of self-esteem. Your mother's not going to know what to do. Your mother isn't either. She's gonna, she's gonna think some other child came home today, isn't she? Every six weeks we select a super kid from every grade level. And at awards assembly, the parents are recognized as the parents of super kids. And the kid gets a t-shirt that says super kid and everybody uh, recognizes that student. Annabelle Lopez, you are a super kid. Annabelle? Kids also get a big hand for their performance on standardized tests. Lozano students now score at the 83rd percentile nationwide, a far stretch from their ranking of 25 when Ramirez took over in 1982. Taking the next step, that's what counselor Kathy Bregenzer is helping these kids do. She visits each class every week with a lesson that goes beyond the basics. This day she's working with fifth graders. They're about to graduate from Lozano and make the delicate transition to middle school, which in Corpus Christi begins with the sixth grade. In this little suitcase I have things that I would want you to take with you to, to be successful in middle school. Okay, who wants to pull something out of my bag? Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Become smart with a pencil. Become smart with a pencil, okay? <laughs> Actually, what I wanted was a big eraser. But they didn't. Yeah. What about mistakes? How do you feel? They can happen any time. They can happen any time. What do you do with them? Erase them. Erase them. Pretend that can happen. But if you make the same mistake over and over and over, you're going to wear that eraser out, right? <laughs> so that's not good either. Just reach your hand in there and see what else I packed for you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, Robert, chicken. What were we talking about when we talked about people calling you chicken? Yeah, what's that whole thing called? Those are things to do. Peer pressure. Peer pressure, right. What kinds of things might you face as far as peer pressure? Drugs, alcohol. alcohol, what else? Friends, right. If you're feeling like they might think you're a chicken, uh, what's one thing you can do? I heard a while ago. I'd rather be a chicken. I'd rather be a chicken than a turkey like you. Okay. The session seems to work. Are you scared about going? You're not uh, nervous about it? Even though I don't know what it's going to feel like, but you can meet other people from other environments and see what they're like and create new friends. Right? That openness to new people, that cooperative spirit, is nurtured through the team's approach that Lozano teachers often use. And what is it that you have to do as a group? The team approach helps the children work together, talk together, get along together. It also allows for a lively version of drill work. How about turning childhood classic Anne of Green Gables into a basketball game? Robert? Who was the boy that Anne hated? Gilbert Tell me the complete sentence. The boy that Anne hated was Gilbert Blythe. Yes. Yes. Come on, Tell you me. can make it. Oh. Why was Anne always in trouble? Anne was always in trouble because she was talkative. She stood talk to people and never know what she would say. She would tell them bad things, insult other people. Yeah! 
Well, their answers beat their basketball, but after all, this is a literature class. You've both taught in other schools. What, uh, what was it like in uh, those schools compared to Lozano? Teachers didn't share like they do at Lozano. These teachers, you sit in the lounge and you talk, to, you talk about, gee, I'm doing an activity on fractions. They share. At the other schools, I didn't find that you sat around after school. It was like at 3.20, every teacher left. And at Lozano, teachers don't do that. You just exchange ideas. And if I'm stuck, I'll go to Barbara, who's in first grade. Or Barbara will come to me, and I'm in fifth grade. And we just exchange, and we're not the only ones. I mean, everybody in the school is like that. We all want to share what's best for the child. And that message comes across loud and clear to the kids. Meet Yvonne, Robert, and Emily. What's your favorite place to be? School is my favorite place because the teachers, they make you feel that you're special, not only just to you, but to other children. Robert, you went to a, another school. How did that school compare with this one? They wouldn't help you really. They'd only teach you once, and they wouldn't really teach you as much as times as they do here until you learn it. Mm. They'd only teach you once or twice. What kind of grades do you all get? Mine are straight A's. <coughs> straight A's. Yes. Robert? I'm straight A's. Straight A's. Yvonne? Straight A's and A's and B's. When you uh, think about yourselves in 10 or 15 years, what do you think you'll be doing? Going to college and finishing up our education. Mm -hmm. Robert? Same, sir. Going to college? And Yvonne? Going to college or trying to study to be a lawyer to be a lawyer. And uh, after college for you, Robert? Probably run for president. Run and for try, president? Try out. And would you be a, a Democrat or a Republican, Robert? Probably Republican. Probably Republican. Would you be a conservative or a liberal? I haven't looked into that yet. How about you, Emily? So after I finish co college, I would hope to be a petroleum engineer. A series of soaring ambitions for poor Hispanic kids, most of whose parents were dropouts. If uh, many of your parents are illiterate or semi-illiterate, uh, could it be that the good you do here dies at 3 o'clock? It used to die at 3 o'clock, but we're not letting it die at 3 o'clock because we're bringing those parents in every week and we're teaching them how to keep it alive. Every year we uh, try and share with you some of the things that we have done with your children. A lot of things that we teach them that we want you to continue to do during the summer. Could they maybe forget what they learned the, the past year during the summer? What could I do? Uh, we're going to share several ideas. Do you think that is something schools ought to be doing, All is teaching parents? Is that, is that the role of the school? Most definitely. I think that many times we don't give the parents enough responsibility to join with us educators in the education of their children. And I think it takes not only the, the principal, the teacher, the administrators, it takes uh, the parents working together with the schools. And that's where a, a lot of schools are failing in not involving the parents. Parents like single mother Lily Morales, who was at Lozano all day, every day, as a valued volunteer. My kids are... They're glad that I'm here. My little girl from first grade, she's real happy. When she sees me, well, you can see that big smile from her. And, hey, mom, you came, mom, today I'm glad, man. So parents who never finished school are determined that their children will. Hands up, let's go, ready? Teachers who are committed believe that every child can learn. And despite the odds, these kids are meeting those expectations. You know, it's a whole family working together what, what has made the school succeed. Manhattan, Kansas, Landover, Maryland, 
Lowell, Massachusetts, and Corpus Christi, Texas, four happy and productive schools. Incidentally, students returned to Lozano this week to learn that Maggie Ramirez is no longer their principal. She was promoted over the summer to run the special emphasis middle school just around the corner from Lozano. At the start of this broadcast, we promised to try to identify the qualities that make those four schools and others like them successful in the hope that many more schools could, in effect, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Most talk about improving public schools centers around money or equipment or technique or discipline. And though they were important to the staffs of our four schools, none was the key to their success. The key has less to do with budgets and buildings than with respect and relationships. We found that the principals and the teachers at the four widely separated schools shared strong, sometimes fervent views about what it takes to build a successful school. What we found first at each of the four was an embedded belief an almost wordless devotion to the cause of public education and its worth to a democracy. Listen to John Murphy, the superintendent of schools in Prince George's County, Maryland. I don't believe that any youngster should fail in public education in America. I don't think that children fail. I believe that schools fail children. And a successful school is a school that does not fail any single child. We said that we wanted to, as a majority minority school system, prove that black youngsters could be as successful as affluent white youngsters in public education in America, to send a resounding message to public education that education can work for all of America's children. Columbia Park, I think, is perhaps the best example we have. Here's a school that is predominantly black, 90-some-odd percent black. 90% of the youngsters coming to the school have some form of public assistance. Uh, many of the youngsters come from single-parent families, teenage mothers, all of the factors that educators in the past have used to explain away failure exist in this school today. And these youngsters can outperform the best and brightest in any school in America. Now, if it can happen here in Columbia Park Elementary School, it can happen at any school in America. And that's the critical message that Columbia Park has to give to public education. What we found second at all four schools was a collegiality among the teachers. In most schools across the country, teachers tend to teach in isolation, confined for much of the day to the four walls of their classrooms, and rarely involved in professional give and take with their fellow teachers. But this was not the case at the schools on this broadcast. Here are three teachers, beginning with Steve Clark, the sixth grade teacher in Manhattan, Kansas, talking about each other. There are teachers in this building that, that have loads of experience and young teachers that come into the building, they, they go to these teachers and they learn things from them. We learn things from each other. We feel free about going into one another's classrooms to watch each other, to observe other children in, in different age groups. It's, you've, we think nothing of a sixth grade teacher going into a kindergarten class and sitting on the floor and getting into the, the lesson that, that they may be going through it at that point and getting something out of it to take back to our classrooms or fourth grade teachers sharing uh, activities with third grade teachers or spending time in each other's classrooms. We learn from each other and there's, there's a lot of that going on here. One thing I enjoy tremendously about teaching here is the sense of esprit de corps. There is just such tremendous support here for whatever you're doing. And we've heard from other folks who have gone to other schools that they don't have that same sense of camaraderie there. And we have a belief that unites us that all children can learn and that we can get the job done. There are hurdles that must be surmounted, but when we work together as a team, that can be undertaken. And the children, I think it sets a wonderful example for children because they see us working together and sharing ideas and they see that cohesiveness, so they work together as an entire school. We have teachers who have created, you know, good relationships in this community over a period, a long period of years. I think uh, teamwork, we have worked very, very hard breaking down the barrier, sharing, uh, not teaching in isolation anymore, and I also think communication, and a good example of that would be like our staff meetings with agendas, our committees that report each time, our lead teachers who report each time. Just the constant communication makes it for a very strong school. We found third, and in striking visibility, 
that our four schools were relatively independent from their local school districts and that our four principals shared with their teachers much of their own authority and responsibility. I think it's extremely important for people to be making decisions down where they should be made, right at that level of the classroom, working with youngsters. I think it's extremely frustrating over the years for teachers and top-down uh, organizations to constantly be dictated to by memorandum from central office. That's a very demoralizing kind of a management style. And they're sitting there getting these directives from people who aren't in daily contact with students. They know they've got a better way, a better solution for that problem, yet they're frustrated with these demands that they're getting from higher ups. And I think if we can turn around now and say to our teachers and to our principals, look, you're, you're hired as professionals. You have the expertise. We respect your expertise. Our job is to assist you. We want to give you whatever assistance you need to get the job done that you think needs to be done in your school. And when the teachers begin to take that kind of ownership, the principals take that kind of ownership, I think progress moves much more rapidly. I think there's a misconception sometimes on the part of principals that you have to control everything, that you have to control leadership. And, and in my mind, uh, you do have to, you, ha you have to be a leader, but at the same time, as I empower people in this building to do things, as, as, uh, as people uh, start managing uh, what's going on and, and leading uh, in, in the building, I think that improves my leadership. Uh, I don't feel like they're stealing leadership away from me. I think my, my leadership uh, uh, grows because of that. And I still, unfortunately, see in my travels of a lot of top-down management and mandates from, from people on high. And in my belief, in my personal opinion, professional opinion, that's not the way to, to breed success. You, you got to have that ownership. You got to have that buy-in at the school level. You can't mandate that. You, you earn that through ownership and in, in the process and that's a lesson that we need to learn I think that when you're looking at a team effort you're looking at shared responsibility so when we make a decision on the school planning and management team it has to be something that comes through consensus or the decision isn't made I wanted it truly to be a, a collaborative effort where we were all equals on that decision-making team I do believe that a principal is the instructional leader. I don't believe that a principal's veto power is what is going to decide whether a school is going to be successful or not. One of the issues that we've addressed very, very candidly in our own organization is with our central office administrators to make them aware of the fact that they are not a power source, they're a help source. Their job is to go out and bring assistance to the real power source, and that real power source is the classroom teacher and the principal. When I was in the application process, I heard this was a school where teachers had a lot to say, a lot of say in the governance of the school, and I heard that parents were very involved. Uh, I was actually warned about the school, and I thought that what was negative to one person was very positive to me. They said, well, you, I don't think you ought to apply for that school because the teachers are really very actively involved and they have too much to say. I was looking for a school where the teachers took responsibility and where the parents would be involved. And so those were pluses to me. I didn't really want to be a dictator, an autocrat. I wanted to work with people. I felt my strength was enabling other people to become the best that they could be rather than dictating and being an authoritarian boss. So I wanted a school where teachers and parents cared a lot about the school and already were actively involved. Maybe it worked at one point in time. Uh to be an autocrat and, and the bureaucracy and the, the heavy control at the, at the central office. But uh, to me, problems with education in America are going to be solved school by school and, and by staffs of, of teachers and, and a principal working together and with parents and kids. And it's not going to be mandated down. It's, it's going to happen at those, at those sites and, and work its way up. We found forth that unlike so many principals who seem to bristle at the appearance of parents, our four principals regard mothers and fathers as critical to the success of their schools. I think what we're trying to do now is we're trying to recreate a sense of community, a sense that we maybe had in the 30s and the 40s, where the teachers and the parents were neighbors, communities and friends, where the teacher knew you, the child at home, and knew your parents and there were shared expectations of what school would be for you. And recently that's been disrupted. Uh, there isn't that sense of continuity between home and school. Many times the teachers come, live in one community, 
the parents and the children live in another. And so to recreate that lost sense of community, we need to involve the parents more in the schools. So I made a blanket invitation, which several parents have taken me up on over the years, and I'm glad, is that this is your classroom. You know, I don't have one of those, I do not feel uncomfortable when, when parents are around, and I don't teach differently just because there's a parent in our room. But I say, you know, you've trusted me with your child for six hours every day. That's a long time. Please come in, come to lunch, come see what your kids are doing. And we eat in our rooms on Friday. A lot of parents like to come on Fridays when they know they're going to be just with the class, and they really, they really like that time. You see, we again in public education, we tend to blame parents for not getting involved with their schools. When in fact, the school often rejects the parents. The parents aren't rejecting the school. The school doesn't understand the problems that the home brings to the school setting. And so we've got to get out and become far more, more aware of what some of those concerns are, be sensitive to the needs of those parents, and then begin to engage them in the learning process with their child. Why would a school reject parents in the first place? They don't do it intentionally. It's not intentional. Our schools are basically middle-class society. And when somebody comes in that doesn't conform to middle-class society, they're rejected. It's not a conscious effort on the part of the school. One of the big tasks was to Im impress upon the children that they could learn and impress upon the parents that they could learn and that if we all work together, that we could make their children excel in school. We talked to the kids a lot. Uh, the, the parent, the teachers made them believe in themselves by telling them every day, you can do this task. Uh, you can learn to read. You are able to do this type of homework. And then we also right away uh, put into place parenting meetings for the parents. We met, we still do meet with the parents weekly to ingrain upon them that their children can do it, that there, that there was an ability there that needed to be tapped, that needed to be pursued, and that we were going to do it. What we found finally was a simple and pervasive commitment to children, to their importance, to their self-esteem, and to their capacity for learning. We begin with Renee Miley, the fourth grade teacher in Manhattan. I think that the kids are first, no matter what, no matter how much work it takes, how much energy it takes, the kids are our priority, no matter what. So people don't rush out the door at 315 with the kids right behind them. And I think Northview has been able to take kids and put them first and, and communicated to the kids that they're important. And I think the kids know that. I think the kids that, that walk in to Northview know that the t every teacher is there for them. And last year we had a mentor program where we paired up students who, who were having some sorts of difficulties with a staff member, and the idea was that the staff member would touch base with them a time or two a week to let them know that someone else in this building does care, someone's watching out, and someone knows if you come to school or not, and someone knows if you're feeling good or you're feeling bad today. We had another program, um, the clubs, and this is out of a concern for some students who, when they leave here, don't really have a place to go for an hour or so. And it's, there's a reason to stay after school and to have an interaction with a teacher that's not just your classroom teacher. Uh, you sign up for the clubs and it'll be a different teacher who's working. But I think we've tried very hard to get that idea across here that there are caring adults in this building, not just the person you go to their class each day, but someone who cares. Cares if you're here and cares if you're doing okay or not. It sounds like a, a cliche when you say we care, but there's a difference been, between saying we care and showing that you care. You show you care between the, the hours after school and, be, and when school starts. You don't just care when the kids are in the building. You care about your kids when you leave to go home. You're still thinking about problems that they might be having at home. It's, it's really hard sometimes to think about some of the conditions that some of the kids that come to your classroom each and every day come from. They might go home and, and have an abusive parent whether it, the parent is abusing them or uh, abusing drugs or alcohol. And then this kid gets up every morning and he feeds himself and he comes into your classroom. And you, you take some of that home with you every night. You have to take all that into consideration and, and, and show that you care, that you understand what he does between the hours of, of 3.30 and, and 8 o'clock the next morning. What could be clearer? What could be more simple? How could we have lost sight so easily of the solution to our school problems? 
All our educators need, we figure, after a documentary such as this, is a camaraderie, a commitment to public education, an independence from the bureaucracy, an involvement of parents, and a belief in children. But to get up from the television set thinking that's all that's needed would be a serious miscalculation. What else is needed is something the teachers themselves are reluctant to talk about openly, and it is our respect for them. It is what's missing in America, and it is what's been too long withheld from a profession as important to our national well-being as doctors or captains of industry or TV commentators. From sunup to sundown, the school teachers you have seen tonight work harder than you do, no matter what you do. No calling in our society is more demanding than teaching. No calling in our society is more selfless than teaching. No calling in our society is more central to the vitality of a democracy than teaching. I'm Roger Mudd. Good night for learning. The